Well, today we begin a new sermon series called Relevant, Why the Christ Church Still Matters. And I want to start with a little backstory of kind of how we arrived on this current sermon series. It started with a trip out west from the Brown family last summer. We went on sabbatical to uh, a Luther Academy of the Rockies, a, um, a, a continuing ed learning event for the entire family. And so there's the family out in Estes Park in Colorado. Yes, Katie and I took three children under the age of nine all day, two days in a car. You've done there, been that, some of you I know. <laughs> but it was good. And it wasn't just a pleasure trip, like I said, it was a working trip and as part of my sabbatical. And myself and my family are just so grateful to all of you for supporting us in this time away from the church. A sabbatical is a time for respite for the pastor, and let me tell you, I was emotionally burnt out after seven years, day in and day, in, day out, caring uh, for the church. And it's also a time of renewal. And so there was some education that took place. And like I said, Luther Academy of the Rockies, as far as I know, is the only continuing ed event for the entire family. For example, uh, in the morning, the kids kind of had a beefed up uh, Sunday school, and there they are in our lodge giving devotions for all of us one day. The little blue guy is uh, Brock, our three-year-old, leading us happily in devotions. <laughs> so <laughs> while they did that, the adults, we also learned and got together and, and talked. And uh, if we could go to the next slide, please, Jacob. So there's a picture of myself and some of my uh, Wartburg fellow graduates as we gathered to talk, to, to talk about some serious issues in the church. So the reason I went, like I said, was because it was a time of rest and renewal. I liked that the whole family was going to be there, and the topic was almost kind of secondary. But the Holy Spirit sure took a hold of my heart when, when I found out what it was. We were looking at uh, the changing U.S. landscape of the church, and it was pretty dramatic. I know this graph is hard to see. I'll, I'll walk you through it. On the left is uh, 2007 as the world stood in terms of how people identified uh, with Christianity. 26%, the largest category, said they were evangelical Protestant in 2007. The next category was Catholic with 23%. And then mainline Protestants, which would be all of us, Lutherans, Methodists, so forth, and, and the third category. And the fourth was what we call religiously unaffiliated, and at the bottom was non-Christian face, it was about 4%. Well, fast forward there, uh, seven years to 2014, the right side of the graph, you can see all the red lines pretty much have gone down. That's the decline that all of us in every branch of Christianity is experiencing, no one is, is as out of it. But that blue line has just skyrocketed. The second place, the second largest category of faith now are the religiously unaffiliated at almost 23%, a quarter of Americans, and this is 2014, I'm sure it's gone up since then. But what are the religiously unaffiliated? Well, those are the people who either A, grew up with no faith, and they continue to, to have, you know, not an, be a part of the organized religion. Or two, uh, they were a part of the faith growing up, or as an adult, maybe even very active in the faith, but said for one reason or another, you know what, it's just not for me anymore. I'm just done with church. And so we would call them the duns. And the people that have never been in church, we would call them the nuns. So we were studying intensively for 10 days this rise of the nuns and the duns in the United States of America. And it, like I said, it was quite alarming. So one of our speakers uh, was Reverend Dr. Nate Frombach, and Dr. Frombach has been here before. Uh, he's from Warburg Seminary. I, he taught me. He's an amazing, amazing speaker, and he, he had some good things to say about the church's response to the situation. The first being that when we cast our vision, either as a local congregation or as a wider church, we don't do so in a vacuum, but we, we do so discerning God's work in the world in context. So we take our context into our discernment when we cast our vision, and we certainly want to do that uh, in the changing context of the U.S. landscape. The next thing he said was, our mission is sacred, but our models aren't. The mission of Jesus Christ, the gospel for all people, is a sacred mission. But the models in which we distribute that information is not sacred. Our churches aren't sacred. We can change them. For instance, uh, one older pastor who is a retired pastor serving um, 
uh, a rural Nebraska congregation stood up and prayed for us one day and he said, uh, Lord, <clears throat> may we be the bride of, of Christ, the church, and may we be ever-changing, but may we also always be connected to our groom, the Christ, which is never-changing. I thought that was pretty, pretty strong stuff. The third thing Nate said was he called pastors to raise up and bless leaders working in emerging contexts. And I would share the same encouragement for all of you. What does this mean? Well, again, an, another older pastor with uh, some gray hairs on his head raised his, his hand and said, you know, uh, Pastor Nate, I hear what you're saying about the church and, and it's changing dynamics and we need to change, but I'm going to tell you, I'm here, I'm not going to change. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Is that wrong? And Nate gave a very grace-filled response and said, absolutely not. And I'll say the same thing to you. If you feel like, hey, I, I hear what you're saying, Pastor Craig, the church is changing, we need to change, but I can't change. I'm just going to keep on worshiping like I do traditionally until the cows come home, and that's just fine. Because we need you too. You are the backbone of, of the Christian movement, and that will not change. And so Pastor Nate said to this older pastor, keep on, brother, keep on doing what you're doing. We need you. But at the same time, there's going to be this parallel process happening where we're going to be raising up new emerging leaders in emerging contexts. They're going to try to reach out to these nuns and duns because that will be life on earth in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It won't be the way we did church in the 1950s until today. So it's a both and. So keep doing what you're doing and keep encouraging people in emerging contexts. The last thing he said was, the three fastest growing religious groups in the United States are the Muslims, the Mormons, and what we would category, categorize as the nuns and duns. The Muslims and Mormons, it makes sense when you think about it, they're very structured. So it's going to, uh, a segment of the population is going to be drawn to that for the, you know, strong families and so forth. But these nuns and duns that are dramatically increasing is, is an interesting topic. One quote he said that we hear a lot from people in this category is that they'll say, you know, I believe in God, but not the church, not the institution. I, I'm willing to believe in Christ, but I just don't see the relevance of the organized church in my life anymore. And so as I heard this quote, I sat there praying about it, thinking, you know, <clears throat> I've given my whole life to this movement. And I walked away from a career in broadcasting that I would love to go back to. But I love Christ, and I love Christ's church, and I love all of you, and I love spreading this message. So there's got to be some aspects of this movement that are, are, are worth saving, that are still relevant, even to the nuns and the duns and the changing U.S. landscape. So I sat there and I sketched out a sermon series of about four or five different things I could think of, of where the church is still relevant. I took it to Nate, and he said, this is really good, Craig. And I took it back here to our, our church and our worship team and our leadership. And they said, let's go for it. And so we're going to preach on those very themes the next six weeks with this being the introduction. Those themes are, uh, the first one being, the church, the organized church provides us support during tough times. You all know this. I've heard this from many of you. You've said this to us. Oh, I don't know where I would be, Pastor Craig, without the church when I went through, you fill in the blank. A, a, an illness, a death a tragedy, a job loss. The Christian church provides support like no other during tough times. That's a no-brainer. The second is unconditional love. There are lots of places we can seek out and find love in the world, but oftentimes it's conditional love. We say, I'll love you as long as you love me. And if that uh, reciprocal relationship continues to exist, uh, then we'll continue to love each other. But as soon as you mess up and stop loving me or fall out of love with me or, you know, make me upset, then I'm done loving you. That's the way the world loves and that's the way contracts go. That's the way business and partnerships go. But that's not the way the Christian church goes. The Christian church, Christ calls us to love each other unconditionally. Because that's the way God loves us. The third is an unparalleled place to grow in faith. I think of all the people who are out there, yeah, I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious. I, I believe in God, but it's just kind of at a surface level. I'll read a Facebook meme that will inspire me, or I'll uh, you know, hear a sermon, or I'll go to a, a Bible study or something and get a little bit inspired. But you really don't grow deep in your faith. And here is the place, the organized church, we're set up to, to grow you deep in the faith. You who have been in spiritual transformation, amen, you know this, right? Amen. The sermons you hear, 
The experiences here, physically being here, the Bible studies, the classes, the transformation, the Sunday school, it happens here. It's unparalleled. The fourth aspect I thought of was it provides a unique and holy encounter with God, the sacraments. There's nowhere else in the world where you can experience the direct contact with the sacraments of God. That is something unique that the Christian church has. We're talking about the welcome you receive eternally in baptism. We're talking about the forgiveness you receive tangibly when you receive the bread and the wine and it becomes a part of you. That happens through the local church. And finally, the last thing is to provide a place or a community for like-minded believers. This is not just during tough times, but all times. Good times. And those that we've, we've studied, Pastor Steve and I have, have studied the nuns and the duns. We've read several books. And the thing we hear time and time again is, is those who have walked away from the church miss that community. And they try to replicate it everywhere they go. And it's just not the same. It's not the same. The, the terms of Christian community. And I'm going to close with that here in just a few minutes. So that's the outline of the next few weeks. Here are the preachers. One, you got to put up with me, but hey, you know, I study this stuff, I immerse myself in it, so I've got a passion for it. I'll be preaching in a couple weeks. We're, in, we're excited to invite Reverend Sarah Getch, uh, a young, vibrant pastor from U of I, uh, University of Iowa campus ministry, Go Hawks. So she, uh, she ministers to the 30,000 students that are really in the heart of all this, all these millennials that are dealing with these with these issues and she's doing an amazing job folks. She's going to be her guest preaching. She, you know, she took a group of 30 uh, University of Iowa students up to Wartburg Seminary in Dubuque and three of them signed up to be pastors. I mean she's doing some incredible stuff. So she's going to be here. She's been talking to us excited. And then a guy by the, you know by the name of Pastor Steve but the rest of academia knows is the Reverend Dr. Stephen Knudsen. <laughs> And I draw that distinction because he got his doctorate in this very stuff. His whole dissertation was, was people who have left the church. And so he's just as excited and fired up as I am to talk about this stuff and have some real honest conversations. Now hopefully all of you on the way in uh, received a rock. Can you pull those out for me? If you didn't, you can grab one on your way out. I want you to, uh, to hang on to it this week. And just hold it in your hand and if you've got one and look at it for a second. Choir, you're getting yours after the service. Don't, don't worry, okay? So if you feel its texture, you feel it's, it's not exactly smooth and polished, is it? There are some rough edges. There are some sharp edges. And we look at this movement called Christianity. And we're going to look at the, the text, the scriptures, over the next six weeks of the earliest, the beginnings of Christ's movement, the church. And to see where Christ intended and, and maybe where we, we've gone astray. And one of the very first people that comes up to Jesus is a guy by the name of Simon. And, Simon, and, and Jesus renames Simon. He says, you're going to be called Cephas, which is Peter. And he later explains why he gives him the name Peter. In Matthew, he says, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. On you, Peter, a human being, fallible and with rough edges and sharp corners and imperfections, you're who I'm going to build my church on. It's human beings, Jesus says. It's not some, he didn't set up some stodgy institution with a bunch of rules and rule keepers and, and to make judgment and make everyone upset and leave the church. No, Jesus started a movement with imperfect people like Peter. Peter questioned his faith. Three times he denied Jesus. I don't know that guy. In the most critical hour when Jesus went to the cross for all of us, Peter is the perfect example of what the church is all about. And you and I are in the same image as Peter. We're fallible rocks, but we are the church friends. It's us, imperfect people. And if, I encourage you to take around this rock with you wherever you go. Put it in the console of your car. And look at it as you drive around this week. And put it in your pocket or throw it in your purse. And wherever you go, God goes with you. And if we think about that metaphorically, if every single believer would have a rock with them, when we gather in places, no matter where they are, it's like we pile up our rocks in a pile. Let's say you're at a coffee shop. You and a few other believers. It's like you metaphorically put your rocks up on the table when you gather. 
Let's say you're in a movie theater. Let's say you're in a small group setting not connected to a church. Let's say you're in an online community of faith. Wherever that is, that is the church. These areas are emerging in houses and other places. Christ's church is still alive. And we need to raise up leaders and reach out to people in this way. But I would also make the argument that when you come here, we all pile our rocks at the altar and we gather here. And this is also a place that we can be church. They say that the church is, is a hospital for sinners. Martin Luther said, you know, who needs a doctor? The healthy don't. Healthy people are off doing healthy people things. You only need to make an appointment and go to the doctor, right? When you're sick. And the church, Luther says, is here for sinners. It's not here for people who've got it all figured out. It's for sinners. And so when we come on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning or some other time, it's like we take our rocks and we pile them up here and it's a collection of sinners. Worshiping God, caring for one another, and being the church. How do we ever get away from that? That's what it's called to be the church together. So that's a little bit of a table setter. That's what we're going to be talking about. I hope and pray that you commit to coming to the next several weeks and hearing all of these uh, wonderings of why the church is still relevant today. And I hope and pray that you feel God's presence. I don't know. We don't know where you're at in your journey of faith. Maybe you're, you're disconnected right now. You feel disconnected or you've got one foot out the door. It's okay. We're not here to judge. We're here to love. But I would encourage you to, to hear what we have to say the next few weeks and ponder in your heart where the Christian church might still be relevant.